Good evening, everyone. My name is James Ritchie, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's BOFAS Virtual Journal Club on behalf of the Scientific Committee. Uh, I'd also like particularly to thank our speakers tonight, particularly the senior authors, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Butler from Truro and the redoubtable Mr. Bob Sharp from Oxford. I'd also like to thank our IT support, May Libidi and her team, and my co-chair, uh, Nigel Vazakuti, and uh, the registrars who've kindly prepared presentations for tonight, Milo Kostuviac and Rebecca Martin. I apologize, Milo, if I just butchered your surname. For those of you who are old lags, we will, uh, we will follow the usual format tonight. For those who are virtual journal club virgins, there will be two papers uh, for presentation. The first will be presented, then we will have the senior author, Mike Butler, reflect upon it, and finally take Q&A for a discussion of that paper. I will then hand over to my co-chair, Nigel Vazakuti, who will take us through the same routine with the second paper, and there'll be a brief round at the end. Um, please do feel free to submit questions. I would encourage you to do so. Please submit them through the Q&A and not through the chat. Uh, I believe in the interests of public decency, you have been banned from uh, submitting questions anonymously. So please either use your own name or that of someone you don't like and wish to humiliate publicly. The, um, also, please try and stay on topic. It may be of great interest personally to know when Bob Sharp will pay back for 50 quid that he has owed you since 2005, but that's probably not really suitable for general discussion. A couple of other matters of housekeeping. In order to get your uh, certificates for tonight's meeting, you will need either to scan the Q&A code, which will be displayed on screen at the end of the meeting, or failing that, you can reply to an email which you should receive in the next 24 hours uh, to get your to fill out the questionnaire and get your feedback uh, and certificate that way. You will, however, still need an alphanumeric code to activate that, and that will be put up in the chat uh, again at the end of the meeting tonight. So either scan the QR code or note down the alphanumeric code and then activate the email tomorrow. So um, without further ado, um, let's move on to the first presentation. So Milo is going to tell us about Mike Butler and Steve Parson's paper on arthroscopic subtalar arthrodesis through the sinus tarsi portal approach. Take it away, Milo. Hello everyone, thank you for inviting me to give this presentation to BOFAS Journal Club. My name is Milo and I'm the Orthopedic Registrar in the Northumbria Healthcare Trust. The paper that I'll be presenting today is a case series of arthroscopic subtalar arthrodesis to the sinus tarsier portal. This series was um, performed at the Royal Cornwall Hospital NHS Trust and it was published in Foot and Ankle Surgery in 2017. Subtalar arthrodesis is an effective procedure for elevating symptoms, correcting malalignment, and improving function. The most common indication for the procedure is isolated subtalar arthritis, whether primary, post-traumatic, or inflammatory. Open subtalar arthrodesis is not technically demanding procedure, but offers high um, union rate of about 84 to 99%, and relatively low infection rate of 0 to 6%. However, Arthroscopic anchor arthrodesis has now become widely accepted, and the rationale for arthroscopic approach to subtalar arthrodesis is to minimize the soft tissue injury um, during the surgery. There are numerous arthroscopic approaches to the subtalar joint, but this talk will focus on sinus parasite approach. The aim of this study was to determine the outcomes of arthroscopic subtalar arthrodesis in a large series of procedures performed using a two portal sinus parasite approach. Study design. It was a retrospective review of case records between 2004 and 2014. These cases were of isolated arthroscopic subtalar arthrodesis, which were performed by two senior and experienced orthopedic surgeons. Um, cases that were included were um, anyone with painful condition of subtalar joint. However, um, some patients were excluded, and these included those with severe bony shape deformity, 
such as a malunion after calcaneal fracture, or severe loss of calcaneal height or extensive bone loss requiring structural bone grafting. Other patients that were excluded were those of require, requiring a complex fusion procedures of multiple joints, such as um, the tail and navicular or calcaneal cuboid joints. The opera technique has been described in this paper, and it involved a saggy lateral position with two lateral port sides and the cortication performed using a bony burr, and fixation was done using two partially threaded cannulated screws. The recovery initially involved a non bearing splint for the first two weeks. This was then converted to a partial weight bearing in a cast, which then was either converted to a moon boot at six weeks or, or carried on in a cast um, up to uh, until 12 weeks post-operative time. This image shows a patient already prepped for the operation um, in a saggy lateral position with a foot hanging off a box or a cushion. Um, this image shows a two portal, two lateral port incisions, and the foot is marked to show the position of the sinus tarsi, distal fibula, and anterior cross of the calcaneum. This image shows two ports already inserted into the ankle joint. This diagram shows um, how the decortication has been performed. Initially, a posterior facet was decorticated, starting anterior laterally and moved posterior medially using a bony burr, and then additionally, medial and anterior facets were also decorticated. Final fixation was performed using one or two parallel 6.5 or 8 millimeter cannulated partially threaded screws. Um, initially, two screws were used, but uh, around halfway through, um, uh, through the data collection, it was noted that, it, uh, that the surgeons converted to single screws fixation. Outcome measures. Primary outcome measure was a successful subtellar fusion, and this was evident when a patient presented with a pain-free fusion site on weight bearing or pain-free fusion site during normal, uh, during manual coronal plane stressing, um, or there was an evidence of osseous trabecule crossing more than 60% of the arthrodesis on AP and lateral radiographs. Secondary outcome measures. This um, it mainly included uh, complications such as infection, nerve damage, or discomfort from metal requiring screw removal, but also it, it involved um, time to fusion and duration of inpatient stay. Results. 77 procedures uh, were performed on 74 patients with a successful um, arthrodesis in 75 procedures, which gave the results of 97.4% of, of fusion. Um, two patients um, then had to under, undergo um, a open revision of arthrodesis with bone grafting for pay, painful aseptic non-union. One revision surgery was performed in a patient whose initial fusion surgery was done for arthrosis following calcaneal fracture. Another case of primary sub, uh, subtellar arthrodesis has been performed on the background of prior anchor arthrodesis and tendon transfer for congenital telips equivinus. Both of these cases then um, successfully progressed to subtellar union. One of these revisions was a smoker, the other one wasn't. And 10 cases had prior surgery on ankles, but others did not indicate what procedures they were. Um, all but one of these patients had successful arthrodesis. Secondary outcome measures. Time to fusion, the mean time was 15.3 weeks with a wide range of 6 to 56 weeks. Those with a reported fusion time of 6 weeks were clinically and radiographically assessed earlier than the standard 12 weeks, and that is because they came to the clinic for unrelated reason. Um, and those with a fusion time of greater than 12 weeks were unable to attend um, the initial intended 12 weeks uh, follow-up period um, and therefore came in uh, at a later date. Duration of inpatient stay, the mean length was 1.25 days. Complications, there were no intraoperative or immediate postoperative in, in, uh, complications. However, um, seven patients um, had to have the metal removed due to localized impingement pain with um, the symptoms resulting in all of them um, there was one superficial skin infection in, in, um, in a patient, uh, which then resolved with antibiotics. One patient developed neuropathic pain in pseudo-nerve distribution, 
um, but this again resolved spontaneously. And one patient unfortunately developed complex regional pain syndrome. There was one case of rupture of FHL, um, and this happened 12 months postoperatively and required um, surgical repair. And one patient developed DVT, but this was two years following surgery. Discussion. This study demonstrated successful outcomes of arthroscopic subtellar arthrodesis through the true portal cyanostase approach. Comparable fusion rates were noted to open approach. However, um, the time to document a fusion does seem long. Um, and it is possible that some of the patients have fused earlier than 12 weeks, but the routine follow-up was only done at 12 weeks. Some patients were assessed before 12 weeks um, for unrelated reasons, and uh, some of them were found to be fused earlier. It has got com a, a better complication profile than open approach. And arthroscopic septalar arthrodesis is technically demanding procedure, and the learning curve for both surgeons have been included in this series. For example, um, early in the series, partial injury to FHL tether has occurred, which served as a reminder that the care needs to be taken when decorticating a medial aspect of the posterior facet. Um, another learning curve um, that was encountered by, this, by the surgeons was the number uh, of screws needing to be used to achieve a stable fixation. Early, early in the series, a two screws were used. However, it was noted that one screw was sufficient enough to achieve a good fixation. Uh, limitations. Um, the retrospective design of the study represents a weakness um, limiting the strength of conclusion when comparing the results to other published uh, results, uh, including an open approach. Um, whilst computer tomography would have increased the accuracy of union assessment, um, it was felt that the combination of clinical assessment and plain radiograph was good enough, and it represented the routine follow-up practice for most surgeons. Conclusion. The authors have concluded that the two portal sinostarsa approach, arthroscopic septalar arthrodesis, is safe and results in successful union in 97.4% of cases. One 6.5mm or 8.5mm cannulated screw is sufficient for stabilization and compression of the fusion site. And finally, care should be taken to avoid damage to flexor hallucis longus tendon when decorticating the medial part of the posterior facet. Hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Hello everyone. Well, thank you very much, uh, Milo, uh, for that for that excellent summary of the paper. Um, now, can I invite, please, uh, Mr. Mike Butler, one of the senior authors on that paper, to share his reflections upon that work, uh, the topic, and life in general with us, Mike. Uh, hi. Thanks. Thanks, James, and thanks, Milo, for doing a really excellent summary of, uh, of that paper. Um, I would just also like to point out that um, Steve Parsons, who uh, is, was the kind of senior author at the time, um, probably contributed the two thirds, at least of the cases. And he was one of the original, uh, I guess, UK based surgeons that adopted the technique. I started as a consultant in 2000. Uh, Mike, we seem to we seem to have lost you there for a moment. Um, so while we try and get Mike back, I think um, what what Mike was commenting on was that the uh, he was one of the two main authors of that paper, but Steve Parsons was the more experienced author who essentially pioneered. The uh, was one of the great pioneers of subtalar arthroscopic surgery and indeed subtalar arthrodesis in this country. Steve now uh, now now retired. Mike, uh, can we shall we shall we try again? You're back with us. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry about that. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Sorry. Um, so I was just saying uh, one of the things I like about the paper, similar to Ian Winston's original arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis paper, is it does reflect the learning curve both from a Steve, who was a senior consultant who started the um, uh, started using the technique, and myself, who started in, in 2009 as a consultant, having worked for a number of uh, different people that did it, 
taking it on and so it reflects my learning curve as a consultant as well um i think one criticism uh the papers had before and when i presented it and seen it presented before is this kind of how are you accurately assessing union um and a number of sort of senior colleagues in the past have, have asked why we don't do ct scanning and i guess um if the patient's coming back and is out of pain and you feel you've got clinical and radiological evidence, I'm not sure of the value of CT in, in uh, exposing them to more radiation. Um, we did change from two screws to one screw on the basis of a paper that was published in the, um, the early, I think 20, 2010 and 2012. Uh, I haven't found a problem with that. These, these days, I have to say, um, if I can get two screws in, I will, but generally just use one screw and that seems to be reasonable. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions or um, or any comments about the paper or the technique or, uh, or indeed anything on topic. <laughs> okay, Mike, so um, f first question, I take it, it, it this is still your, your, your default technique for a primary subtalar arthrodesis. Absolutely. I, I haven't done uh, an isolated open fusion since I started as a consultant, actually, mainly because in the first sort of few years of my um, career, Steve and I used to operate alongside in different theatres. Uh, and even if I tried to sneak in a quick open fusion, he wouldn't let me have it. So uh, I, and I've, I've kept doing it, to be honest. And the only time uh, I do do uh, an open subtalar fusion, um, is probably for a triple because uh, arthroscopic triples take a long time and we have pressure to get on with cases. If I'm doing it combined with um, an anchor replacement, I think it's easier just to do a small uh, sinus tarsi approach and do it that way. Otherwise, it does add to tourniquet time. Um, and depending on the time available, if I'm doing an arthroscopic TTC, uh, I sometimes do a little open approach just because that. Uh, the lateral screw, um, by the time you've made two arthroscopic approaches and then you're trying to fit that screw in, it's much easier if it's, you know, a small inch, inch and a half incision, and then and the screw fits in easier and you uh, avoid the perineal tendons as well, I guess. Yeah, that, that, make, that makes perfect sense. So um, some questions uh, coming in. Um, first question, um, does not a single screw fusion show higher risk of non-union compared to two screws? Uh, clearly, you feel it doesn't. Um, yeah, we, we, I mean, when Steve started, he used two screws. I have to say, as I started as a consultant, I, um, I only was using one screw. And it was on the basis of a paper that it might even been a, um, a poster uh, at EFAS or BOFAS with a decent case series. And they were saying one screw and there's some biomechanical evidence in there as well. So we went to um, we went to using one screw and haven't hadn't really noticed a difference. You know, if it's a really big individual in the space, then I'm quite happy to put two in. But generally, it's just one screw. Okay, fair enough. Um, so uh, further question, actually, what are your thoughts on the posterolateral portal to prepare the posterior for set? Um, is that something that you you have any experience of? So um, I've been teaching on the sort of Bristol and Cornwall course for some time, um, and uh, we do teach that postlateral portal. I know the Bristol guys are very keen on it. On occasion, it's it's helpful just because you do get a nice view at the back of the uh, the back of the subtalar joint. I haven't found I've had to do it very often, um, uh, but I think it's a it's a safe and reasonable thing to do. You get a, you've got a good view of the back of the uh, ankle joint. You know, you can you pop a green needle in. You see where the you see where the needle's going, and you can you can do that. I teach on the course that uses it, but personally, I've never had to. But it, it you know, for some people, it does. I think maybe the triangulation is easier, and once you're looking at the back, they find it very easy to start preparing or finish the preparation from the back and then move forward. Okay, fine, fair enough. Uh, what size burrs do you use for it? As a question. Uh, it's normally the standard 4.5 um, 4.5 barrel burr. Okay. So as much for an ankle arthrodesis. Okay. Yeah. Um, the hospital let me. I'd 
I love the, uh, I mean, other companies may provide them, but the Arthrex do this kind of, uh, I can't remember what it's called now. It's like a, a different type of burr that goes forwards and backwards, like a, an auto rasp thing. If you can sneak one of those in, it's just, it's in a perfect orientation to prepare the surfaces. But um, the mean people at my hospital won't let me use it. Yeah. I think I think the mean people inhabit most of our hospitals, Mike. I don't, I don't think you're alone uh, in that in, in any sense at all. Um, uh, question: What was the reason for the high non-union rate in the presence of ankyl arthrodesis? Uh, the think? high non-union is that in our paper? The high non-union rate. Well, I, I have to say, I thought I think I, if, it, if it was, I I sort of missed it. But uh, Dr. Gajula wishes us to, to answer. I think it may be a question about subtalar fusion in in general following ankyl arthrodesis. Uh, I I've not experienced a high non-union rate in the presence of ankyl arthrodesis. Um, I don't think I've had a non-union, but I would never use screws in isolation for that surgery. I think the uh, Steve and I. Um, I've always used a hind foot nail. So I think it gives better biomechanical uh, strength. Um, and they're just the, the strange forces that go through the subtalar joint when trying to fuse it when you're weight bearing them early. I, I think two, one or two screws isn't enough. Yeah, um, I think that's right. I suspect the question is more related to TTC fusion. Um, question, how do you select patients? Uh, in fact, I think that refers to your exclusions from the paper Severe deformity was excluded, and I think also post calcaneal fracture. If you wanted um, to use structural bone graft, is that still the case, or do you have any other selection criteria for the arthroscopic technique? Um, it's I, I use well anything that needs structural bone graft. Clearly, you can't do that through a, a minimally invasive approach because you need, uh, on occasion, especially after the malunited um, former cases. Um, I did a case recently. It almost required half a femoral head in order to restore the alignment of the of the of the ankle and subtalar joint. But um, yeah, and the, and the only time I, I did go through a phase of if someone had a calcaneal fracture uh, fixed and in reasonable alignment, but they had soft tissue pain, I started a phase of you know removing the metalwork and then going through the process, seeing if that did that did them any good or not. And then going through injections and then trying arthroscopic um, fusions, but in those cases, it it, uh, it was in, pretty difficult on occasion to get into the subtalar joint reliably. And I also found that taking the metalwork out in the presence of arthrosis um, didn't really make a great deal of difference. So I I changed my line of attack to um, if you have got um, subtalar pain related to a calcaneal fracture with previous fixation. Uh, the lateral plate, obviously, I would take the plate out the same way it was put in and then fuse open. Yeah, that that, that, that seems perfectly sensible, logical. Um, quick technical question. Do you use headed or headless screws or screw as you're using one? Uh, I'll use whichever the hospital have available. Um, I tend to use... <laughs> I tend to use the headless screws now. I quite like the, um, uh, I quite like them. There, there is a, you occasionally get an issue with prominence of screw head, um, but if they're not available, you know, a 6.5, 6.7 headed screw um, works perfectly fine. Yes, yeah, so I think for many of us, it comes down to what's what actually could be found on the day. If indeed, if you can get the size that you've asked for, you're probably doing quite well in some units, certainly <laughs> my experience. Um, uh, okay, so just a couple more questions. Uh, inevitably, with as with all arthroscopic techniques, um, what's your average tourniquet time for an arthroscopic fusion? And do you think it's different to, while well, you don't do open fusions, how it would be if you were doing open? Mm -hmm. uh, and, undoubtedly, uh, an open one is, is is a bit quicker. But these days, you know, tourniquet time, about 60 minutes. Um, obviously, if there's, if there's there may be difficult, difficult technical aspects depending on the original pathology, um, but sometimes longer if you're lucky. Sometimes quicker. It's actually quite amazing if you're doing an arthroscopic combined TTC how quickly you can manage to get the ankle and the subtalar joint in uh, prepared, knowing that you've still got to get the tourniquet and get a nail up there as well. Um, but you know, compared to when I started, it, you know, as you get uh, as you get 
more experience that the times come down um but you know it it takes a quite amount of time to do a uh, to do a good job yeah i think as as with anything um a question is there a role for simultaneous arthroscopic subtalar joint fusion and total ankle replacement yeah, so I, I mentioned that before um Yes, there is, but um, the trouble is that your best, when I'm doing an ankle replacement, personally, um, quite a lot of it at the start before we start, before we actually sort of drape and get knife to skin, is making sure that the knee's pointing at the ceiling, the limb is well aligned, and I think it makes it easier to, um, uh, if you're using the the commonest ankle worldwide at the moment because of the intricacies of all the x-ray and the jigs that you have to use um, if i've got a patient on their side or saggy lateral um, a it makes a lot of mess because there's lots of uh, saline everywhere and um, i don't really like repositioning the, the patient and starting again and i think it i think it just adds too much time and i, I i'm a bit anal about the positioning because i think it, it makes the initial jigging and the anchor replacement a bit easier if you really work on getting the patient uh, positioned correctly, you know, knee to the ceiling uh, and all the rest of it. Does that, does that make sense? I, I think that makes perfect practical sense. Um, we're almost uh, at time, but just one um, final question, which is, uh, I, think, I think it's posed as, as, as a question, though it's really a sort of challenge. Does it not make it easier to prepare the subtalar joint through two posterior portals, one either side of the tendo Achilles? Uh, uh, it, technically possible through the sinus tarsi, and it does make it a bit more challenging if you're getting to the medial, if you want to get to the medial and the anterior facet. And if you're going to go on and prepare a tail and navicular joint arthroscopically as well. And um, I guess, you know, sometimes it's difficult to teach a, an oldish dog new tricks when you're very comfortable and used to doing something and it works for you, you, you stick with it. But um, I, you know, I do posterior ankle arthroscopy. I haven't found it to be um, as easy as um, as the as standard ankle and the, and the, and the sinus tarsi approach. Oh. <laughs> Small cat. Okay, we lost you slightly at the beginning of that, Mike. So that was, I take it that was a sort of a, no, actually you prefer the sinus tarsi approach. Absolutely, yeah. It just, it, I do what works it, um, and I find it easier. I think patients prone and doing, doing them that way, it just, uh, maybe it's my kind of technical ability or hand-eye coordination that finds it easier to triangulate and do it that way around. Okay. Mike, thank you very much for coming on and for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, uh, please feel free to, uh, to hang out and join in this sort of general abuse of the second paper, if, if you wish. Uh, thank you once again. Right, so can I please now hand over the reins to my uh, excellent colleague, Mr. Nigel Vasakuti, uh, who will be taking us through the um, second half uh, of the evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, James. Hi, I'm Nijir Vaskuti. Um, we'll move on to the next paper for the evening, which is a paper from the Oxford team um, comparing minimally invasive and open calcaneal osteotomy, looking mainly at the complications. This will be presented by an ST4 trainee, Ms. Rebecca Martin from Northern Deanery. And after Ms. Martin's presentation, we have uh, Bob Sharp, uh, the senior author here. Um, to give us his thoughts and reflections, and also to take some questions. So over to you, Ms. Martin. Hello, my name is Rebecca Martin and I am an ST4 Trauma and Orthopaedic Registrar in the Northern Deanery. Today at the Bofast Journal Club, I am going to present the paper Complications of Minimally Invasive Calcaneal Osteotomy versus Open Osteotomy by Kendall, Khalid, Ball, Rogers, Cook and Sharp. 
This is an article which was published in Foot and Ankle International in February 2015. Within the paper, there are no conflicts of interest with regards to the research, authorship or publication declared, but there is mention that the company who manufactures instruments for minimally invasive calcaneal osteotomy, Ortho Solutions, did provide a research and development fee. So in terms of the background, calcaneal osteotomy is a widely used method for the correction of hind foot deformity. Traditionally, operative incisions involved a lateral approach posterior to the tip of the fibula, and these were often associated with wound complications, damage to the sural nerve, and damage to the perforating arteries. To reduce the incidence of these complications, a minimally invasive technique was developed, and this is performed through a 5 mm incision using a low-speed, high-torque cortical burr. The aim of this paper is to compare the rate of early post-operative complications between the new minimally invasive technique and the traditional open lateral approach to determine if the minimally invasive technique is a safe alternative when performing calcaneal osteotomy. This is a retrospective case-controlled cohort study of all patients who underwent a displacement calcaneal osteotomy between January 2008 and May 2014 at a single centre. The primary outcome measure was the 30-day perioperative complication rate, and the secondary outcome measure was the rate of union, calcaneal displacement distance achieved in millimetres, and hardware failure. All operations which were performed in this study were by the same two foot and ankle consultants, who are both listed as senior authors on the paper. Information that was obtained for this study were patient demographics, date of operation, duration of follow-up post-operatively, underlying diagnosis, additional procedures performed, duration of inpatient stay, post-operative complications. So all osteotomies were fixed using either a 6.5 or 8mm cannulated screw placed under fluoroscopic guidance through a 10mm posterior stab incision. All wounds were closed in the same method using interrupted monofilament sutures dressed and placed in a protective below knee cast. Post-operatively, all patients were non-weight bearing for the first four weeks, followed by a period of partial weight bearing for four weeks and then fully weight bearing. All patients were given VTE prophylaxis for a full 12 weeks. Elevation for the first two weeks was encouraged post-operatively. Patients were seen at two weeks for suture removal and then again at 6 and 12 weeks for clinical review and x-ray. X-rays were assessed by a blinded independent radiologist to assess for radiological union and evidence of hardware failure. So there were 81 patients in total included in this study. 31 patients had a minimally invasive technique and this was divided into 24 women and 7 men and 50 patients had an open technique and this was 34 women and 16 men. As we can see within the table, the age range for these patients was between 16 and 77 years old, with a mean age of 47.7 years. Indications for the operation were very similar between the two groups, with the most common indication being an adult acquired flat foot deformity. The operations performed, as we can see, are also listed on this table with the most common operation between the two groups being the same, a medial heel shift plus FDL transfer, and the second most common operation being a lateral heel shift and CMT correction. The results were compared between those patients that received each technique. The GraphPad PRISM software version 5.0 was used to apply Fisher's exact test to look for a statistically significant association between the type of operation and the primary outcome. A student's t-test was used when analyzing data with a normal distribution. The minimally invasive technique had seven complications across seven patients and the open technique had 25 complications across 22 patients and this was statistically significant. There was a delayed wound healing rate of 28% in the open group versus 6.45% in the minimally invasive group and there was a significant difference in the rate of wound infections, with the open group having 20% and the minimally invasive group having 3%. 
No patients in the minimally invasive group had a sural nerve neuropathy, but there were three in the open group, one of which was a permanent change. There was not a significant difference in the average calcaneal heel shift, as there was a difference of 9.4 millimeters in the minimally invasive group and 10.2 millimeters in the open group. Union, as per the radiological analysis, was achieved in 100% of open procedures versus 97% of minimally invasive, so this was also not significant. There were no instances of hardware failure in either group and no significant difference in the length of inpatient stay. The average total operative time was similar between the groups. So in terms of the discussion, the paper then went on to discuss a previous study which looked at anatomic specimens and found that the sural nerve on average lies 2.1 centimetres posterior to the tip of the lateral malleolus. The perforating perineal artery is variable in its anatomical location and also variable in where it arises from. The artery runs deep to superficial posterolaterally to run directly posterior to the sural nerve superior to the calcaneum and it is therefore noted that this is at risk when dissecting the nerve in an open approach. The authors then go on to describe the different techniques for performing the osteotomy, which include an extensile lateral approach, direct lateral approach and percutaneous approaches. They describe in detail the open approach and the minimally invasive approach that are used in this study. The MIS approach is favoured by the authors as the osteotomy is performed in a more controlled manner with a low speed burr. It can be advanced into the middle of the bone and then under the image intensifier a corticotomy can be performed inside to out. This limits periosteal and soft tissue damage and the equipment also has the added benefit of protecting against thermal necrosis by saline running through the burr. Like every study, there are some limitations. This was a single centre study only, which looked at the 30-day complication rate, and so it is impossible to comment on medium or long-term results. There is also the possibility of selection bias when choosing those who will receive a minimally invasive technique, as it is possible that more complex cases may have had an open procedure due to the perceived difficulty of the case. There were also no patient reported outcome measures collected for comparison between the two techniques used. Open approaches and minimally invasive ones were not being used at the same time necessarily, as there were only six open techniques used since the introduction of the minimally invasive technique. This means that there could be other factors influencing the improvement in the outcomes over this time period. In conclusion, The conclusion of the paper states that minimally invasive surgery is a safe and effective surgical technique when performing displacement calcaneal osteotomies for the management of hind foot deformity. Minimally invasive technique has significantly less wound complications postoperatively and achieves similar calcaneal displacement to open approaches. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for a very nice summary of uh, this excellent paper. Um, we are glad to have the senior author, Bob Sharp, here. Um, most of you know, uh, Bob Sharp is a consultant foot and ankle surgeon in Oxford University Hospitals. Um, he has published extensively on arthroplasty and MIS surgery. So let's hear from him um, his reflections and thoughts on the work that has gone behind this paper. Oh, thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, I'm still laughing about the fact that we, the group who developed the only validated patient outcome score, didn't do any patient outcome scores on our own paper. So yeah, that was that was quite amusing. Um, yeah, so like Mike said, really, it just reflects our early learning of a new technique. So I think nowadays, you know, we do all our osteotomies and most of our hind foot stuff minimally invasive. And, um, you know, the operative times now we're doing, you know, calcaneal osteotomies, I'm sure most people in school are doing them, you know, it's, it's, you do it in a couple of minutes. We no longer do the final corticotomy and the osteotome. We just use the burrs the whole way. There have been a few changes in the interim and in that um, we um, 
no longer have access to the All Solutions Burr. They don't really support the product anymore. And the reason we like the All Solutions Burr was it was really high torque and really low speed. So now we've had to change. I think we use the Arthrex and the Striker Burr now, which are a bit whizzier, a lot faster. So uh, whether they're causing more thermal thermal damage or not, or whether that's the problem, I don't know. Or anyone who uses the Burrs knows they have a little water jet on the side that squirts um water down the side of the burr but in my experience it just bounces off the skin so what we actually need is a is you know maybe the burr is hollow and maybe we can squirt water down the burr to actually get it where it needs to go um and the, the weakness of the paper the thing we realized in retrospect was when we were writing about the wound complications most of the wound complications as anyone who does hind foot surgery will know they're coming from the screws that you put in through the heel so what we should have actually done is separate out the wound complications from where we've made the MIS portal versus the old Atkins type scar versus the wound complication that's coming from the screws. And to tell the truth, I, can't, I don't think I can ever remember having a wound problem from the MIS entry portal. And you think there might be a few because that's where the burr is whizzing away. Um, but actually the wound problems we had were where we put the screws in. So again, looking back at Mike's paper, we no longer put any screws in through the heel for sub tailor fusions. We put them all from a tailor net going anti-grade for that very reason. Um, so this is probably the only operation left where we put screws in from the back. And I know some people are using headless screws. We're not a huge fan of those in Oxford. We've had lots of failures with them, uh, especially on the ankle fusion. So we've gone back to headless screws. We discovered that 20 years ago. But what we do now is we countersink them in, never use a washer, and we just countersink them in. Because the screw, it's such a stable osteotomy when you're doing MIS. It's not like it's going to fall apart. Um, it's not going to distract the only, what it's really doing. It's a bar to shop it to stop the displacement moving back medially or laterally. So I think um, a head, we use a headed screw, but countersunk, and that's cut down our, our wound complication rate even further. Um, I think when you look at the um, discussions of you know what were the weaknesses of the paper, again the usual thing you know, is it was really a, a series, and what happened during the middle of this time period we changed from open to MIS. So virtually all the latter ones were MIS so it reflects a bit of a learning curve um in in terms of were we doing the more difficult cases open rather than MIS probably the opposite the more difficult cases we were doing MIS because we as we got better at them it got much much quicker a lot less soft tissue trauma and for the patients having CMT corrections and the um you know the big sort of corrections for flat foot because you're doing so many other things at the same time it's all about time and minimizing the, the sort of the wound destruction so the big deformities we, we definitely do them all MIS just because it's a lot less soft tissue trauma I think so I take it, um, is MIS your go-to option for suitable four-foot cases as well, first ray and DMMOs? And yeah, funnily not, actually. I think I think we're about to change, having seen the new Arthrex jig that was out at Bopass this year, we probably will change. I think, you know, has anybody produced, the, the reason we produced this paper was everyone was suddenly switching to M MIS hindfoot without any re anyone really having looked at the risks and you know what it's like when these trendy procedures come out everyone's keen to jump on the bandwagon and seem to be a thought leader and we just kind of thought hang on we better look at this is, is this actually a safe thing to do so this isn't really an outcome paper this is a hey this is a new technique is it safe paper and i'm yet to see that and the four foot stuff i mean in, in my practice i'm just seeing disaster after disaster of mis four foot surgery came up to us from london and other places uh, which again, I'll just reflect the learning curve. You know, look at France and Spain, they're all doing MIS four foot and getting really good results. The USA had the opposite experience. They effectively banned it. The results were so bad. And, um, you know, we're just seeing some disasters coming our way for, for bailout from elsewhere in the country. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, the same principles we've done here of working out is this procedure safe? It'd be good to see the same data coming out on the four foot stuff. I think I just got the feeling at BOFAS this year, there's going to be an explosion in MIS four foot because the new jig seem to make things look so easy, but I suspect there's going to be a few disasters on the way. And uh, we need to make sure we don't go down the US route where everyone and his dog started doing it without any training. And it was just an absolute fiasco. So I think we just need to be a bit more careful about assessing new techniques and not just go charging into them and, you know, get some proper training done. And, you know, having a go on a saw bone at, at Bofast for three minutes probably doesn't count as adequate training for doing a new technique. Right. Thank you. So just got some questions here in the q a box uh, first one was there any difference in the amount of lateral shift between the open versus the mis technique yeah i think that's data on the paper no difference at all actually you know both are about 
nine, ten millimeters effectively. I think that data is in the paper. Um, when you do it in the real life, it's it's harder. I find it harder to get a big shift laterally. When we're doing the CMTs, you never get as much shift laterally as you do medially. And the other thing you learn is you do more of them as to, the, what's the most commonly performed operation in orthopedics? It's manipulation of the C arm to make your X ray look better. And it's the same really with the calcaneal osteotomies because sometimes you move it even though you can you can feel how much you've moved it through the skin and you can you know palpate the edge with a burn you know you've moved it a huge amount and sometimes you do an actual x-ray and you think god it's hardly moved and then you move the x-ray 10 degrees and suddenly you realize you've moved it a huge amount um so it's quite important especially when you're learning to just play around with that and you're always in a rush and it's i never know one's in a, in a hurry to get going we watch our trainees do it but actually just take that few minutes when you're doing the the, the arm at the end just to check you've got the actual displacement you want and the other shock you sometimes get is you do an actual x-ray and you think great my guide wires right up the middle where i want it to be and you alter the angle five degrees you realize you're up against the medial or the lateral cortex so just take a bit of time doing a decent actual x-ray and you'll really see how much you're moving this and if if you're only moving it a couple of millimeters you're doing something wrong you need to go back and do it again and the, the top tip i would give everyone that i've learned from doing these now is is when you've done the bony, so at the start we'll use a little rasp, I'm not sure if the other group's got, but the author solution uh, comes with these little rasps, some are straight and some are bent and some are bent the other way, and just go in and clear the periosteum along the line where you want to cut and almost like guides itself then. But then when you've done the osteotomy, just go around again with the uh, rasps and just clear off the periosteum from either side of the osteotomy and you'll suddenly find it moves a whole lot more. It's like when you do a scarf osteotomy when you can't move that first metatarsal and suddenly you put the knife down the lateral side and just release the periosteum at that distal lateral corner and suddenly the whole thing you know jumps a centimetre. It's the same with the MS. Just make sure the periosteum is released and then it suddenly jumps a huge amount. Yeah, next question. Any incidence of tarsal tunnel syndrome when performing lateral shift? Um, not that we know about. And it's, you know, have we seen anyone come back with long term problems? No. The, when, you, when you're doing it, you've got to be aware of the anatomy. So if you look at people's heel bones, you do it. Some people have got a big posterior tuberosity, some people haven't. And then I've seen a few where we've gone too posterior and you've just ended up with a little narrow you know bit of bone at the back and you think oh god i wish i'd left a bit more and then the reason that's happened is everyone's too paranoid about going forward so you don't go into the tarsal tunnel and you don't hit the neurovascular bundle the scary bit is when you go through the posteromedial cortex which is when you do it and it doesn't move i can tell you now it's the inferomedial cortex that you haven't gone through properly with the burr and when you do go through it with the burr you suddenly see the patient's toes flex and whether we're touching a nerve or whether it's directly touching, you know, one of the small muscles in the foot, maybe the abductor uh, or quadratus or something, it suddenly, you suddenly makes you aware of, you know, all the neurovascular studies that structures that are around there. And again, the, the problem with this operation is you actually have no idea where the sural nerve is. You have no idea where, you know, some of the other branches are. Like any calcaneal osteotomy, they're doing open or MIS. We always warn the patients as risk of damage to the medial calcaneal branch. And I think the quoted rates of numbness and immediate last the heel are about 10% from open osteotomy. So there's lots of things to be aware of. And really, you're kind of relying on good luck as well as judgment to make sure you don't clobber any of the nerves. And I'm sure out there there'll be people with serial nerve damage, there's going to be people with tarsal tunnel damage, there's going to be people with medial plantar nerve damage, lateral plantar nerve damage, all sorts of possibilities. But hopefully not if you kind of have in your mind's eye where the anatomy is and, and kind of where you're going. Another colleague has asked for some advice. So he gets a good shift after doing an MIS osteotomy, but by the time he's fixed it, he's losing the displacement. He's not sure what he's doing wrong. Can he have so a couple, couple of reasons that? So, so the first thing to say is, so we use, again, Ortho Solutions A screws, which have got these massive wire. The reason we like them so much is the guide wires are so strong. They're not these little wispy things. So you put the big guide wire in. Now, the Ortho Solutions screws are self-tapping. So, so you don't need to drill them. Now, if you think, if you are drilling, and you shouldn't need to drill, but if you do drill over a guide wire, immediately the guide wire is in a tunnel that's bigger than the guide wire. So it immediately moves back half the distance to the wire. So, so what I would say is don't ever drill, just put your guide wire in 
and then fire the screw in. And what I actually do is I will get my reduction and then I'll kind of hold it. And you've got kind of got your hand right around the, the hind foot and you've got your thumb pressing on the osteotomy and the bit, you know, the posterior bit of the calcaneum where you're pushing sideways to hold it. And then I'll put the screw in. Well, initially, I'll put, when I'm first in the I'll put the wire in and I'll stop just short of the osteotomy. And I'll put the, the guide wire driver right down against the skin and almost use it like a joystick and physically pull on the on the wire driver and the wire while I'm pulling it with my thumb and force it as far medial or laterally, depending which way you want to go with the joystick. And then when as you're doing that, then you fire the wire across and then you fix your osteotomy and then it holds it. And then if you then just put your screw in without drilling, it's going to stay there. It's not going to move. So, so maybe don't drill, just use a self-tapping screw and just use the wire and the drill as like a joystick to kind of hold it where you want it to hold. Next question. Is there any preference for Chevron or a straight osteotomy? Oh, I don't think I've got the technical capability to do a chevron, so I, I, I don't think mine is straight either. Mine will be all over the place. Mine's probably, I don't know, random, but it, unfortunately it's a very forgiving osteotomy, isn't it? So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I tried to do a straight cut, but I know it's not. And then, you know, just thinking about it, you're moving your hand like that, and you, you're, you know, you're in 2D, you think I'm making a straight cut, but if you ever see TVs afterwards for any reason you're all over the place. So yeah, if anyone thinks they're doing a straight osteotomy, they're probably not, we just do the best you can. Next question, uh, what additional procedures do you use along with basic calculated osteotomy for a flexible flat foot? Is there a standard protocol that you follow or is it an a la carte approach? Oh, I, well, it's a bit of both, isn't it? So, you know, if somebody's got a flexible, you know, two Bs, I mean, you know, tip post, tendinopathy we'll just do a heel shift i'm i say it's a different RNA hospital so myself paul who's now retired but paul and i would do is do a heel shift we'd do an fdl transfer we do a spring ligament plication started putting a few synthetic ligaments in now for spring ligament plication occasionally you find people have got a tibio spring ligament tear as well so we'll fix those up um, I did my fellowship in Australia, where if you mention the word authorised to screw, you have to go and stand outside theatre for an hour with a dunce cap on. So I've never used the authorised to screws. But I think it's the work of the devil, but I know one of my colleagues uses them. And he takes them all out shortly afterwards, But and he he uses it as a splint. He says what you're actually doing is just holding everything in the right place where it heals, and he'll take it out. So I don't think you should leave them in permanently. I'm, I'm not speaking from a position of experience. I've never used one. Um, but I don't, I think I get a good enough fix with the soft tissue correction. And I'll pull, when I do my FDL transfer, I'll pull it really tight. You know, at the end of the operation, the foot's, the problem we've got is of getting the patient's foot back to neutral from varus because um, we tighten them up so much. And that just sort of seems to work for me. Um, the, the big question for me and something we should be looking at studies is when you're doing the flat foot, what do you do if you get in there? So the tip post tendon's gone, that's easy. What do you do when you get in there and you find a big swollen tip post tendon? Do you leave it in there and just rely on the fact that the foot, the heel is now being shifted? They've got another tendon helping them. You've repaired the spring ligament. You've helped repair the tibio spring ligament and just hope the tendon is going to recover. Or do you excise it? So if you excise it, you know the patient's pain's gone, but you then deprive them of the ability to mend their tendon. You know, every other tendon in the body heals. Why wouldn't the tib post tendon heal? So what would be a really interesting study would be to look at the people who've got the big swollen tendons and just compare the results with chopping it out or whether you just leave it and hope it's going to recover when it when it's effectively been splinted and rested it. And again, should we be tidying up the tip post tendon should we be shortening it because they're all stretched up should we do a sort of a z and shorten them at the same time i don't know the answer and i've got a few patients where i've left it in situ and have come back with persistent pain and i've got a few patients where i've chopped the tip post tendon out and the fdl wasn't quite man enough for the job and it failed so i don't know what the right answer is and we should as a group we should probably look at that because it's probably quite an important factor thank you um next question do you did you have any cases where the heel rotated into varus or valgus when it was not intended in the MIS technique? How do you avoid this? I think what he means um, is whether you found it difficult to control once you do a MIS cut. No, I, I, I don't think so. Maybe I do, and I've just been too ignorant to notice. But I, I don't think so. So, yeah, you just cut it, you slide it, it moves, you put the screw in, and it stays there. It is for us now. It's just a fire and forget operation. It. I, I can't tell you the amount of time it's saved. Yeah, you know, what used to be a 
struggle to get a CMT correction in under two hours. Now you can cruise it because you've just saved 15, 20 minutes from what was a Atkins of, you know, even for me to close an Atkins wound used to take 10, 15 minutes. And now you just go bang, saw, and screw goes in. It's, you know, it's five minutes probably at the most. I think we've run out of questions on the chat. No, uh, can I just ask, Bob, you've, you've got mostly historical controls. Your open approach were all historical. Then you changed over completely to the MIS. So would a change in practice or an evolution of your practice have led to a change in outcomes? So I think I know you I'm mentioned sure it. Sure at the end of the better. I, mean, I mean, that's why we did the study. So, so I said, this, this isn't really an outcome paper. This is a, is this new technique safe paper or are we cutting everyone's serial nerves in half? So I think... It, yeah, so the, the the person, you know, the, the reviewers did a great job. You know, we didn't do, despite the fact we invented mox FQ, we didn't do a mox FQ on our patients. But the problem is, you're not doing this operation in isolation. You're doing a heel shift in association with ten other things for the CMT patients. So, getting you know a validated outcome score for what's a tenth of the operation is going to be difficult. We're never going to do this operation in isolation. Uh, there just wouldn't be the indication for that. Maybe if slight, maybe after an anchor replacement, it's a bit varus or valgus or something. So yeah, really, it's just, really it's a great technique. It takes lots of time off the operation, as we've shown. It makes the wounds a lot safer. You're not getting those nasty wounds at the posterior corner of the calcaneum from that dreadful Atkins incision. It just makes the whole thing safer. I think that that was the point of the paper. And um, it's always difficult because you never know what your colleagues are doing around the world. But I'm pretty certain that most people are doing MIS heel shifts now and MIS hind foots and you know all of our Sharko work now is virtually all MIS and knocking bumps off and you know it's just so much easier isn't it so um we we kind of played with four foot MIS and gave it up as a bad job but we probably need to revisit that but without a doubt hind foot and mid foot MIS is the way to go right good thank you so yeah that was a very interesting discussion and some you know some nice questions uh, thank you very much Bob for your for your thoughts and reflections on that. I think James has uh, appeared on the screen. It's just an indication to me to look at my watch and it's we are cl getting close to nine o'clock. Our tea is going cold. So thank you to speakers, to all those who uh, put in questions. I'll hand the hand you hand it back to you, James. Well, thank you very much, Nigel, uh, for, for your excellent chairing of that session. And again, I'd like to add my, my personal thanks to our speakers, to Bob Sharp and to Mike Butler and to Becca and Milo for their excellent presentations. And also, of course, to our IT support team uh, led by May Labidi. So let's now draw the, the evening to a close. I hope it's been enjoyable and informative. Certainly, I've, I've learned a few things. Um, the in terms of your, just to remind you to get your um, feedback certificate. In a moment, May will put up the QR code. Please either scan this or look in the chat and make a note of the alphanumeric code, which you can then put into an email tomorrow to complete your feedback form and get your certificate. Um, Otherwise, it just uh, falls to me to let you know that the next virtual journal club will be after the summer break, September the 13th. An email will come out uh, with more details about that nearer the time. Uh, but otherwise, thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Thank you to our, our panelists and uh, I wish you all a very good night.